Hi, everyone. Uh, happy Friday. Uh, we're glad you've joined us uh, to this Women in Tech global event with Zora Alexander. So a little bit of agenda. Uh, we're going to tell you about our organization, uh, a little bit about Zora, and then she would present her presentation about workspace survival and tribal kit and especially emotional intelligence. And at the end, there will be about 10, 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A. So a little bit about Women in Tech Global. Uh, we are an organization founded in late 2019 that our main goal is to build a global network of women uh, and men. Uh, it's for people that are already in tech who want to advance their career or people who want to learn and transition into the industry. Uh, we provide networking events, workshops, articles, and everything that we do is virtual and, and free. That's one of our main goals is everything to be accessible for everyone. Uh, so you can just find everything online. Uh, we want to emphasize that our events are inclusive and everyone is welcome, regardless of gender, race, ethnicity, or any ex or experience. As long as you wanna, you're interested of what we provide and what you can learn, uh, you're always welcome. So now a little bit more about our wonderful speakers. We're very excited to have Zora. We always care about having exceptional speakers, and Zora is one of them. So she's a senior program manager at Microsoft Digital Security and Resilience. Uh, she helps uh, teams at Microsoft and Tower on strengthening supplier security. Uh, and she has helped prior to her current role, she's helped multiple different roles uh, in tech within Microsoft and within different regions as well across the globe. So she has a wide variety of experience, uh, so she can teach us and uh, yeah, let's get going. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, I am super excited to be able to be with all of you today. Emotional intelligence is one of the topics that I'm very passionate about, and I'm absolutely sure a lot of you in this audience are passionate as well. The past two years has not been an easy two years on any of us. I really don't think any of us had it easy. Being under pandemic isolation, far away from our loved ones, constantly worrying for our elderly parents and constantly worrying for our children, whether they went back to school part time or we did the remote learning. It all has been super stressful on all of us. When the pandemic started two years ago and we went under lockdown, I decided to do something to make my children's life a little bit easier. We thought it was a perfect timing to get a dog. We were able to be at home with him. We could take care of him. As you can see in the picture, we all fell in love with this little guy and he brought so much joy into our family for the entire year that we were at home with him. It was all until March of this year when we got a very devastating news regarding his health. He got diagnosed with renal dyslexia. It is a genetic kidney disease in which it develops in dogs after they're a few months old. Obviously, we didn't know that. And as soon as we found out, we started the treatment. But unfortunately, everything went down so fast and we lost our dog in April. We were also devastated and very heartbroken. At the exact time that we were going through this grief as a family, my husband had to go through a major surgery in April. So here I am, super devastated, losing our dog, so frightened for my husband's health. And at the end of the day, I had to put myself together and pretend to my kids that everything was okay. The truth is, I was not okay. I was going through all sorts of emotions that you can imagine. I was sad. I was angry to why should this happen to our dog? I was so frightened for my husband's health and I felt pretty isolated and lonely under the pandemic. 
as I was going through all these mixed emotions, I was questioning, why should we suffer from our emotions? I'm pretty sure a lot of you in this audience right now, when we all go through those tough, challenging times in our life, we all ask that question. And we might ask even, why can't life be a little bit easier? Imagine a life in which you're not scared of losing your loved ones. Think about it. What if everything was so rational? What if there was no love? You could still get into a relationship. You could get married to someone just based on contractual obligations. No heartbreak, no hurt feelings. But I'm thinking about that life. Yes, it is very appealing. It is simple and it is easy. But the truth is we all are here as the result of all those emotions and fears. Humans could not survive if we didn't have all these emotions and fears. That's how we observed our surroundings. That's how we responded to our surroundings. So in a sense, we like it or not, Emotions are part of our identity and they are what make us who we are today. The reason I shared my personal story with all of you today is we all are human beings and we all go through tough, challenging, crazy times in our life time to time. Having a support mechanism around you and being surrounded by people who have high emotional intelligence in your personal and professional life can really help you overcome some of these challenges easier in life. So now, why do we keep hearing organizations have a lot of emphasis on emotional intelligence component during the hiring process? Generally speaking, when a good hiring manager has an option between two candidates, the candidates with a higher emotional intelligence lands the job. Perhaps if we think about um, tech companies, maybe the candidate even has the one that gets selected has less technical skills. But a good hiring manager always go with that candidate. And why is that? And I do want to add good in front of my hiring managers. And the reason for that is obviously we all have seen hiring managers that do not care about this component as much. As long as the candidate checks all the boxes, good to go, done deal. But a good hiring manager, a good leader, always pays very close attention to this component. And there is a reason for that. Studies after studies have shown and proven the organizations who prioritize this element benefit from it in the long term way more than organizations who don't care. And the reason is these studies have shown the employees who have high emotional intelligence handle pressure better. They make better decisions. They handle conflicts better. They are generally more motivated employees and they respond to criticism better. Daniel Goleman in his book, Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ, divides emotional intelligence into two main areas, personal competencies and social competencies. Under personal competencies, it's all about how much do you know yourself? How much are you aware of your emotions? And under social competencies, it's all about how much are you aware of the emotions of the people around you? And how do you manage your relationship with the people around you? So today we are diving to each of these areas and elements and talk a little bit more about what does this even mean and also how can we get better at each of these elements and 
trust me, if you can get better at any of these areas, you will be in a much better place than where you are today. So the first and most important piece of personal competencies is self-awareness. Self-awareness is all about how much do you know yourself? How much are you aware of your emotions and have a good control over your emotions? So I would like this audience just to just think about it. And if you really think that you're good at it, you got this, please raise your hand. It will be interesting to see how many people right now in this audience think that, yeah, I, I got this, I'm good at it. So I'm interested to see how many hands I can see. One, two, three, four. Ooh, yeah. Awesome. So I wonder some of you might think and hesitate, should I raise my hand or not? Um, and we will talk a little bit. What are some of the exercises that people who have high self-awareness do? And if you think you are doing these exercises from self-awareness standpoint, you are in a pretty good shape. So if you are a person who confronts themselves, meaning we all have those honest moments with ourselves that we question ourselves. For example, if we think about our professional life, if you're a manager, product manager, program manager, if you lead a team, you hold yourself accountable and ask those tough questions, such as, did I set the strategy right? Did I take my team to the right direction? Even if you do this exercise, holding yourself accountable, I can assure you from self-awareness standpoint, you are in a pretty good shape. While it's so hard to identify and realize how much we are aware of our own emotions, it's super easy to look at certain characteristics that some people and off the bat say like, this person has no clue and this person has no self-awareness. So I would like this audience, it will be interesting what are you guys what are you thinking if when you see somebody with certain characteristics that you immediately think oh yeah this person has no uh, self-awareness i would like to see some suggestions comment in a chat window uh, to see let's see Do we have any comment? Overly confident or not confident at all? Yeah, can be. Okay, um, I put um, some of Okay, do we have more suggestions? Okay. So I put some of the characteristics of people that when we see them, we just realize these people are don't have any self-awareness. When you see somebody, uh, somebody bullies other people. These are the type of people that they're scared of their own emotions and they're they don't know what is it that actually they're scared of that's why they're trying to scare other people they are super highly controlling people these are the people that uh, generally speaking they don't know how to control their emotions because they're not aware of their own emotions that's why they're trying to control everything around them because they don't know how to respond to their own emotions. Very passive aggressive people. If we think about our professional life, we all have seen these type of people. We may go to them with a very positive intent to provide some maybe constructive feedback, to 
make things better. They don't even allow you to finish your sentence. They just write a snap at you. They become super defensive. And sometimes you basically regret what you wanted to say. And the people who do not take any accountability for anything that they do, always somebody else's fault, always anything that goes wrong, blaming on other people. So now, whether you think you got this, you're really good at it, or you think that, you know, I really want to get better at my awareness. There are exercises that you can do. The first thing that you need to do is to observe yourself, meaning just reflect on your day, for example, to see what happened that day. In order for this to work out, you need to be pretty objective, meaning you should not judge yourself when you're doing this exercise. Like giving you all an example for my, from my personal life, I have a journal by my bed and I do this exercise two, three times a week, especially the days that I have it rough at work or on my personal life. I jot down right before bed everything that happened that day without judging myself. I just jot down because I want the data. What happened that day? Once you have that data, then you can analyze that and you can ask, why did you do those why question? Why did you react it that way? Why did you snap unnecessarily at one of your colleagues, for example, that day? So another example would be when my kids come home, like when I did this exercise, when my kids sometimes come home, they threw their backpacks on the hallway. And being a, being a PM, <laughs> super organized person, that really makes me angry. I, there are days that I warn them, pick it up and take it to your room. And there are days that I really get mad at them. When I did this exercise, I realized every single time the bottom line of my frustration with something else. I have to say, I am not proud of it, but at that moment, obviously, I was not aware of my emotions and I didn't have a good control over my emotions and I took my frustration out of them. So the good news of this exercise is the more you do this exercise, the more you become self-aware of your emotions and you can control your emotions. You can ask your friends and colleagues to provide you very honest feedback. We all have those people in our life that we truly believe that they care about us. I know in professional life, this is a little bit tricky getting feedback from our colleagues. And I have to say 95% of the time, the feedback that we get at our workplace perhaps are not the most honest feedback because we all hesitate to provide some of those very honest feedback because we're not sure how does that impact our relationship with our colleagues at work, um, how we gonna we are going to collaborate moving forward if I tell that person honestly what I think about him or her. But we all have those people in our life that we truly know that they care about us. And sometimes those people provide us feedback in a very respectful way, but very brutal. It can be brutal feedback. But we all know that those are the feedback that we take action up and on and get better and do something about it. So reach out to those people and get their opinion and feedback about yourself and be those people who provide honest feedback for the ones you truly care about. Shift your mindset. I am a true believer of that you can absolutely shift the way you're thinking. Another example would be 
how many times we are getting those nasty emails at work and angry emails and we jump in and click on respond and we respond back in a more angry way and click send. I am not proud of it. I have done that probably more than once. But next time when you get those emails, put a pause on it. Come back to it the day after. Calm down before you're responding to that email. It's fascinating to me that you are forcing yourself thinking about this for five times, for 10 times, by the 20th time, you are automatically respond to situations the way that you ideally want it. And you basically train your brain how to react to certain situations. Absolutely possible. This is something that I personally done that. And it's amazing that you can truly shift the way you're thinking and your mindset. And practice meditation and mindfulness. Obviously, meditation here is not about going to expensive spa days and uh, gym classes. It's all about the time that you take to reflect. Maybe 15 minutes walk per day or having some coffee with a good friend. And be mindful of your surroundings. Don't take any day for granted and spend time with your loved one as much as you can. And look at the glass half by full, being positive. Okay, the second piece of personal competencies is self-regulation. If it was not because of self-regulation, we probably would not get up, get ready, come to work every day. Self-regulation is our values. What is it that we truly believe in? What is it that re is really close to our heart? You need to define your core values. Again, in our professional life, when you look at all these tech companies and all corporations, there are a lot of fantastic initiatives going on. Like allyship is one of them. Become an ally to someone. If you see something is wrong, speak up. But the question is, do you really believe in that? And is this your core value? Because if it is your core value, next time in a meeting, when you see somebody getting talked over, getting discriminated or dismissed, you will speak up. You will not just sit there and watch the show. So, our core values, knowing what is it that we truly believe in is very important because those are the values that we stand by and we take actions and make our final calls. Take responsibility for your actions. If you screw up something, again, at work, let's say you screw up a project, you misguide your team as a leader, just own that and admit to it. How many times we have seen new managers, program managers, they come on, on board and time goes by six months, one year, one and a half years, and they are still blaming the previous management and leadership for the direction and the strategy. So basically, they never own it. They never take responsibility on what they are doing and contributing. And take care of your physical and mental health, especially the past two years. We all have gone through a lot. Hasn't been easy for any of us. So prioritize your physical and mental health because once our physical and mental health is gone, Nothing else matters. So that should be on your top priority list in whatever you're doing in life. And the last piece of personal competencies is motivation. Basically, 
a driving force that help us to do something that we will benefit from it in the long term. Everybody is getting motivated with different things. Some people get motivated by money. Some people get motivated by recognition. Some people get motivated by learning and new skills. There's no right or wrong answer to that. And it's different for every person. But the most important thing is you identify what it is, what is it that really excites you? Let's say the job that you are doing today is not what you ideally want to do. It's not something that um, you're aspiring to do for the rest of your life. And that is okay. But there is a piece of your job that you do every day that you are passionate about. There has to be a piece of your job that you are passionate about. You have to just identify that. And your best shot is sharing those with your immediate manager or a mentor that you have at work. You never know what comes out of it. A lot of times when you express yourselves and share those strengths, what you want to do, maybe there is another project, internal the team, external the team, they keep you in mind and you get that opportunity. But it's important to identify what are the things, what are the things that excite you? And write them down so they look real. If tomorrow I come in and say, I want to be an astronaut, probably it's not a very real goal for me. Maybe some of you in this audience can be, <laughs> but for me, it's not a very real goal. Having said that, I'm not talking about big goals such as maybe somebody in this audience wants to be a CEO of one of these corporations in the future, one of the EVPs. Those are all real to me, but obviously you need to break them down in a smaller goals and find somebody that can support you in this journey. And the last piece is put in a reward system and reward yourself whenever you hit a milestone. I know we, especially as women, I can say, myself included, a lot of times don't take enough credit for our accomplishments. Or when we hit a milestone, eh, well, this is not a big deal. This was not huge. Don't do it. Just, it's a big deal. Celebrate yourself, be kind to yourself and reward yourself whenever you hit a milestone. Okay, so up to this point, we talked about personal competencies. Now we're moving on to the second major piece, which is a social competencies. How much are you aware of the emotions of people around you? And basically, how do you manage the relationship with others? The most important piece of social competencies is empathy. I cannot emphasize enough on empathy. And a lot of times we confuse, we get confused between empathy and sympathy. When I come to you and talk about the pain I'm going through and you acknowledge that, yeah, that's sympathy. And I think majority of people can do that. On the other hand, empathizing with someone, it's a very much, much, much more difficult thing to do. When you empathize with someone, it's no longer about you. You put yourself on the other side and you just try to understand from that person's point of view, what that person is going through. And it is a very hard thing to do. But if you do that and you do it right, then magic happens. And we will a little bit talk about it today. What can happen when you empathize with people? So the good news is we, this is a journey. We all can get better at empathy. 
some of the best practices. The first one is listen more than you talk. We all have heard the famous phrase that says, you have two ears, one mouth. So try to listen. A lot of misunderstandings, conflicts at work happen because we don't listen enough. Again, let's think about it, about the program that we're running. Maybe we have some dependencies and some partner teams need to drive something for us. We grab our requirements and we go <laughs> to that team and say, well, deliver X, Y, and Z for us. Do we take enough time to listen to them as well? Do we listen to understand what is their priority? What is their backlog look like? Why can't they deliver something that we ask right now? Why can't they deliver that, the reason behind that? So we just want to be on track for our projects and with a positive intent because we want to get things done from our point of view, but we totally forget that we need to listen to our partners as well and bring them on board. So a lot of times all these conflicts is as the result of not listening to each other at work and understanding. The second one, allow yourself to be vulnerable. When at the beginning of my presentation, I talked about the pain that I was going through and I did have a difficult time. I I was very scared that my manager and my colleagues see the vulnerable side of me. I was doing covering, yeah. I was just pretending that I got this, I'm strong, everything is okay. I got lucky to have a manager at the time that has a very high emotional intelligence. I do remember after one of our meetings, she immediately pinged me and wanted to talk to me. And she told me that you don't seem okay. There is something not right. Keep in mind, the braver you are, the stronger you are, the more confident you are, the less you're concerned if people see the vulnerable side of you. We all are human beings and emotions are part of us. So there is no reason to hide our emotions from the people around us. Put your assumptions and judgment aside. This is, this is very important and it's a hard thing to do. When somebody comes to you and talk about their feelings and pain and suffering, whatever that is, the last thing for you to do at that moment is to put your personal opinion out there. Again, an example in my personal life, if a girlfriend of mine goes through a tough divorce and she comes to me and talk about the pain and suffering that she's going through, at that moment, the last thing for me to do is to put out my personal opinion. Maybe I knew the guy that she married to was not the best fit from day one. But at that moment, I am just there to be a shoulder to cry on. And I just have to listen to it. Use your imagination. We do all sorts of things with our imagination. We go to the moon and come back with our imaginations. So when somebody talks about their pain and any emotions that they're going through, just think about it. How would you feel about that? Just think about how would you feel if you were in that person, the, the example that I gave about allyship, if you were in that, instead of that person, being constantly disrupted in that meeting and being talked over all of that all the time. How would you feel about that, that? Just try to imagine that. And the last one is 
tune into the welfare and needs of others. If you are in the more senior position at corporation and somebody asks you for mentorship, as an example, if you can do it, do it. You never know what kind of impact your help has on other people's life. Sometimes there are things that we think they are very little helps, but they can have a huge impact on somebody else's life. Okay, now we're getting to the section to talk a little bit about how to manage your relationship with the others. So persuasion skills is when you influence someone to do something that perhaps without you would not have been done. And this is a very important skill as we often hear in corporations at senior leadership team level, bring people that on board and hire people that can be influential. But what does it mean being influential? You can never be an influential person if you cannot empathize with people. If you're not good at empathy, you can never influence people. That is when you listen to the other parties, you can understand them, they feel they've been heard, then you can bring them on board with you and manage that relationship. Communication skills is all about the clarity that you bring into the conversation, the respect that you bring into the conversation. It's very true when they say it's not what you say, it's how you say that. Leadership skills, any good leader that we can think of has good leadership skills in a sense of they put a very good role model that people can look up to and they rally behind and they follow that person. And the last one is conflict management skills. I know a lot of us are generally speaking, avoiding conflicts. We don't like to be involved in conflicts, but you like it or not, there are times that you have to resolve conflicts between two parties by listening to each of the parties and um, without victimizing any of them and make a final fair judgment at the end of that conversation. And the last piece is around some of the myths about emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is not a woman area. A lot of times people think that is something specific to women. It has nothing to do with gender. It's important equally across the board. Emotional intelligence is not the sole determinant of success in life. Obviously, the example that I gave about a good hiring manager goes with a candidate with a higher emotional intelligence is not about the candidate does not have any skill set. It's about the candidate maybe has 60% of technical requirements, 70%, and the rest of it can be learned on the job. At that point, a good hiring manager wants to bring somebody that can bring collaboration skills to the team, communication skills to the team, can more easily bounce back from setbacks, so that is why the person with a higher EI has a better sh chance. Emotional intelligence is not about being nice. I guess we, you need, we need to make sure how we define being nice. If you say person X is nice because that person is a pushover, that has nothing to do with having an high emotional intelligence. 
what if you say somebody is nice because that person can control their emotions when the debates get heated? That person is amazing in resolving conflicts between two parties. That person can stay calm under stressful situations. Yes, that person is nice and that person has a very high emotional intelligence. Absolutely, emotional intelligence is not something that we can label people with, that this person has it, that person doesn't have it. Obviously, it has a lot of factors associated with it since the moment we are born, where we are born, our parents, the, the way we grew up. But at the end of the day, it's a journey and we all can work on aware, our own awareness, being aware of people's emotions uh, around us and become better at it. And the last one, emotional intelligence is not only important for people in leadership roles. A lot of times we think that only leaders in corporations and companies should have a very high emotional intelligence. Absolutely wrong. Having said that, when the leaders at corporate, the higher you go in hierarchy, uh, when they don't have this component, the damage that they cause obviously is broader because they are communicating with a broader audience across the board in the corporation. But at the end of the day, um, it's equally as important for anybody at any level and any role that you have. And I do want to end my presentation by having you all to imagine a world in which we all have a very high emotional intelligence. How would we approach our differences? Just think about it. How would we approach our misunderstandings and conflicts? That will be a world full of mutual understanding, respect, tolerance, acceptance, and a truly and inclusive world for all of us. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here today and listening to me. Back to you, Ali. Awesome. This was amazing. Thank you so much. This was really inspiring and uh, very well delivered talk. I am really in <laughs> awe. Thank you so much. I feel like you could see out of the reactions of all the audience, they really liked it too. Uh, so we are opening for a Q&A. Uh, mm -hmm. we, yeah, we have a lot of responses of people <laughs> saying thank you. And this was really helpful. I agree. Uh, we have a couple of questions. So uh, some from during the presentation. So Jacopo yeah. was asking, can you give a definition of emotional intelligence and how do you measure it in a numeric form? Definition. Uh, so from definition standpoint, I think everything that we talked about today, basically when you are aware, you, you basically, when you are aware of your own emotions and when you are aware of the emotions of the people around you the way that uh, you you people feel more they're they're uh, they've been heard they've been understood you go to corporations and talk to people we all have heard that management doesn't care <laughs> or I, i'm not happy in my organization my manager immediate manager or my colleagues don't get me so I think the definition is when people feel happy in a sense of in their work environment, they feel respected from other people around them. They feel being heard. They feel when their opinions matter in that team, when they say something in the meeting, it doesn't get dismissed. There is a respect, mutual respect in that team. I think that is it for example, and that is one example of having a team that has a high 
AI. I think it goes back to all the practices that today we talked about, how much we are aware of our own emotions and how much we understand people around us. Um, so I think it, it I also it has a lot of different pillars if we want to define it exactly. But as far as the measurements, I think the, a lot, there are a lot of studies out there. And if anybody's interested in, I can send out the list because I did a lot of research from Stanford universities and dozens other that basically they interviewed the 10% high performance employees in Fortune 500 companies. And they did a survey and the num there are some numeric that they, based on the questionnaire, that they ask the questions about the work environment about uh, so they came up with some measurement why it matters when employees um, have a higher emotional intelligence. I mean, it seems like the whole topic is very vague. It's not like like the way IQ is just like you take a test and you just get a score. It's a lot yeah, more it's not, yeah. nuanced. It, so it's yeah. hard to really specify quantitative value to it. Yeah, and then I can send the studies that have been done to Jacopo maybe, and uh, we can touch base offline if you're interested in. I think that sounds good. A uh, couple more uh, questions. So you mentioned you journal two or three times a week. Uh, I was wondering, do you do it when you lose control of your emotions or something get under your skin or do or you do it on both days you feel like you you've done good like yeah for me personally generally speaking when the days that i have it hard uh that's because i think it's uh, applicable for everybody when we're happy those days are not the days, at least for me, reflecting actually why was I so happy that everything was very good and everything went the smooth. But the days that uh, I feel like the example that I gave, I got mad at my kids, for example, I felt so guilty, to be honest with you. <laughs> and I like a uh, guilt that why did I get so mad? It was it has nothing to do with them, for example. So those are the days that I generally and I, I don't feel uh, very happy that day. So those are the day that I try to reflect on the the entire day more and try to get to the bottom line and root cause of what what went wrong that day and what was the issue actually. So that really helped me for next time when it get to that position that my kids drop their backpack. I'm more aware at that point that I'm not having a good day and I'm not going to take my frustration out of them at that point. That sounds that sounds reasonable. Uh, another question was from your experience, what do you think is the easiest way to find people to support your journey? You mentioned you want to find people who do that, mm -hmm. who support mm -hmm. you once you have set your goals. Uh, what mm -hmm. have you done? Like, what mm -hmm. is the easiest way to do that? Awesome. So the, your best shot, if you're uh, obviously uh, in, is your immediate manager, but we all know that not your immediate manager can always help you. Try to find mentors internal at the company that you work or reach out to people externally. Um, having a mentor is so important and you don't have to have only one mentor. You can have multiple mentors, different mentors, and each of these mentors, you can learn something very different. So it's interesting that when you share your aspirations, you share things that you want to do, you share where you want to, you want to get, having those external perspectives really help you. What are your gaps today? So for me, for example, one of my mentors, um, which, who she was pretty honest with me when I talked about my career goal, for example, in three years, she very directly told me, you have a gap in this type of a skill set for you to get to the level that you want. So she coached me, for example, I need to take certain classes because of my career aspiration, obviously, where I wanted to go. She said, you don't have it now. <laughs> so I think the mentors are super important to help you identify uh, the gaps that you have to the journey, to the destination that you want to get and work on your skill set. Just uh, make sure that the um, your destination first and the second, having people, mentors, your managers through your colleagues. There's one mentor, for example, recently I have. I asked 
uh, one of my good colleagues, we are pretty close, that I wanted some, um, some guideline in these areas. And it happened that she knew someone that she connected me with. So um, having those mentors set the a destination and try to learn the experiences that take you to that destination. These are all amazing tips. Thank you so much. This is great. Uh, we have one more question from Tony. As a manager, uh, how do you find the balance between showing emotional intelligence but not getting too personal with your reports? That is that is so hard. Uh, that is so hard. Uh, I think when you sign up to become a manager, uh, I think part of the job uh, is basically um, you you give something from yourself sometimes, and you you have to learn to separate uh, those emotions the time that you go, for example, home, because you cannot have that burden on you the whole time, obviously. For me, um, exercising, uh, having that meditation that we talked about, um, being mindful the moment that I get home with my kids, um, that my focus has changed, my job has changed, everything should stay at work, and I have a personal life. Uh, and again, it's a journey. It's it's so hard sometimes to balance that. But some of the tips for me, at least the two biggest ones are exercising and meditation and uh, having those uh, moments for myself <laughs> to separate myself and thoughts. Sounds good. Uh, we have a follow up on the IQ uh, measurement question. So <laughs> <Is> it's <from Jack? laughs> uh, it's it's still it's from Jacopo. He has a follow up, okay. which is Jacopo, if you can... I, I would love to meet you and maybe in person I can <laughs> we can figure it out. <laughs> if you cannot measure it, uh, so if you cannot measure it, uh, your I emotional intelligence can be whatever you want. Is that true or not? So I think it's... what he's trying to say is like. Can we assume that it's great or not bad, or how do you, like we can decide what our emotional intelligence is? If I'm, I hope I'm interrupting interpreting it correctly. So I, I think uh, one thing is, and I know that we are I have three minutes. Um, I, I don't understand quite his question in a sense of. Um, so what do you mean? You, do you, are you telling me that, for example, in a team, I'm gonna label everybody with a. Uh, you know, you have 70%, you have 60%. Are we talking about that? Because I don't think um, there is such a, such a thing that we can label people with the level of um, uh, uh, emotional intelligence. But what we can do, we can look at uh, some of these studies that shows that when they um, they have the team, the happiness of the employees, the motivation that they have at work, the mutual respect that exists in that team, the retention that the employee, we always heard that that employees leave, generally speaking, because of a manager and not the job. And maybe if there is a toxic environment that you do, you have a very high level of, you don't have any retention, that it's a sign of something is wrong there. So um, I would like to get more details about um, his que her question. So, and I do apologize if I could not land a very specific answer for that, but I'm willing to do some research and get back to her if, if that's okay. Uh, another follow-up comment from Tony is a lot of companies run internal surveys to determine employee yes. happiness, which reflects the managers. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Emotional intelligence. Uh, Zara, if you can also share the deck with everyone and share the link to the deck and share your uh, how people can connect with you for like follow up questions or anything similar sure. like that. Uh, to add on the that idea of emotional intelligence, I feel like a lot of companies care about the holistic. Uh, they they hire holistic have the holistic approach of hiring. So it's not just like your technical skills, but you're also communication, or as you said, yes. your awareness of like your ability to uh, 
admit your uh, wrongdoings or be aware of what went well and not. So these are hard to be really put a number on them, but you could compare to people and see what they have. So, so it's able you're able to compare people about that, about the emotional intelligence, but you can't just give a number. At least that's how I interpret it. Yeah, at a personal level, yes. But again, those studies, I mean, I can send those, some of those studies that they did a survey specifically for higher 10% high performance and they found out uh, why are why are the, the companies benefit from people with a higher emotional intelligence. So. Awesome, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we are we we have no more uh, comments right now. So thank you again for the amazing uh, presentation and answering all the questions. Uh, we are happy you guys all join us. We're very happy Zora you join us for the presentation. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank and you for having me. <laughs> of course, of course. And have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thanks for joining us and looking forward for our future events. Have a good one. Yeah, definitely. Bye. Bye.